courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan, but I'm not joined by Matt this week. We're doing something a little bit different. Since the Flames are on their all-star break, we won't have a new Fireside Chat show for you until next week. But we're going to give you a recent appearance I made on the Shifts and Pucks podcast. Kevin Olenek was on Fireside Chat with me last week, and then I joined him and his crew on Shifts and Pucks, where we talked more Flames hockey and continued a lot of the same themes from our last episode. We also talked a little bit about the Bo Horvat deal as well. So that show's coming right up. Hello, and welcome to the Shifts and Pucks podcast. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter at Shifts and Pucks. Facebook.com Shifts and Pucks, YouTube.com Shifts and Pucks, Twitch.com Shifts and Pucks. Subscribe wherever you get your audio, as well as on the Area 51 Sports Network. As uh, it's been a newsworthy day in the National Hockey League, something uh, the uh, significant trade uh, happened involving the Vancouver Canucks. So we'll, we'll start with that. And we'll get into a bunch of other things with mostly Flames focus, but we'll, we'll, we're going to start with the Bo Horvat trade. But first, we got to say hello to everybody. Hello, Sean. How are things in the cold land of Calgary? It's not that cold anymore. We we got through those those two days of cold of, of a little bit colder than what we're been used to since uh, just around Christmas. But what what happened today? Did I miss anything? Uh, nope. Nope. Do the Canucks Nothing have happened. a captain? Not anymore? Uh, not anymore. Uh, they were jealous <laughs> of the Flames not having one, so they had to get rid of theirs. Yeah. <laughs> a other voice you're hearing is Dan Stevenson from Fireside Chat. How are you, Dan? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, guys. This is part two of mine and Kevin's crossover uh, episodes. It's like Sweeps Week on your favorite TV show where all the characters cross over. Yes. Uh, so yeah, Dan and I recorded a episode of the of the fireside chat last night where we we're, there's going to be a little bit of an overlap in some of the things we talked about, and maybe we'll expand on some of the things that we talked about in there. So you can listen to that now. That's on the fireside chat feed. This podcast will also be on the fireside chat feed next week, as. Uh, uh, they uh their fireside chat is taking a week off from podcasting i've heard of the, no the judge said i'm not supposed to stock the players in the week off in mexico so we got nothing to talk about so we'll put this show on the fireside chat feed yeah so like the nhlpa though you're not going to get fined for it though this is not like the toronto maple leaf getting fined for going a little too early like the podcast, the N- NHL Podcast Association isn't going to go, hey, this is wrong kind of thing? No, Elias just doesn't like it when I'm looking at a telescope at him in the hot tub and trying to see what he's up to. <laughs> Dude, you don't have to go that far to see see a flame 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 guy on the, on his week off. Markstrom's going to all the country concerts here. I, I live just down the street from Ranchman, <laughs> so I can do the reporting very close to home. <laughs> My accountant just said I can't write that off. Oh, what kind of accountant is that? Obviously, uh, Bo Horvat accountant. Smart one. <laughs> yeah. We are going to have a run-in in typical Royal Rumble fashion. Devin is expected to join us here in a little bit. Um, I think what number will he be? Will he be the surprise number 30 entrant of the Royal Rumble? Uh, 69. 69 does they it's a 70 69 person royal be like uh, mysterio this year where we think one mysterio is coming and we get the other at the other mysterio <laughs> yeah and then yes yeah um yeah just don't turn your back and let and let him hit you with the chair like like sammy Zayn and and, and roman reigns <laughs> yeah just yeah like uh yeah for sure that, yeah keep the chairs away keep the <laughs> light lights away um all that sort of stuff, and uh, I think everything will be fine. But, uh, yeah, let's get into this. The Vancouver Canucks did. It, it's in somewhat not surprising move, maybe surprising in terms of the timing, but we can discuss that, I guess. But Bo Horvat is now a New York Islander. Uh, fascinating as Lou Lamorello traded the 
Bo Horvat pick to to acquire Corey Schneider, and now Lou Lamorello acquires Bo Horvat uh, in a trade with the uh, Vancouver Canucks. The Canucks uh, have to retain twenty five percent of Horvat's salary for Anthony Beauvillier at to rut to a the number one prospect in the New York Islanders camp, and I'm not selling this just to make this look better. And a conditional first round pick. If it is not in the top 12, it is a 2023 first round pick. If it is in the top 12, it is an unprotected 2024 pick. So uh, here we go. We were discussing this was the trade that we would probably see something happen in terms of where we w- the Canucks are going. Sean, are you satisfied? with the direction that the Canucks took in this trade. Yeah, I am. Um, I think there was a lot of talk in terms of um, trying to parse words with what the Canucks were looking for. Um, But this is your standard sort of rental package in the NHL. You have a first round pick, which is, these days is always protected. So don't it, anyone that, that expected an unprotected pick, especially this draft, you're crazy. Um, and then you're usually going to get a, a good prospect and then a roster player to make kind of make the, the cap work. And uh, Aturatu. Uh, was the 52nd overall in the 2021 draft, but he was very highly touted going into that draft year. He just fell off. Um, he there was I think there was times where they, pe- people were uh, touting him as a top 10 talent in that draft, but uh, he, he he fell off. But has had a bounce back. He played really well in his draft plus one year in Finland and has looked good in his first North American pro season. Um, this year, putting up uh, 15.7 goals in 27 games with the Bridgeport Islanders and then playing 12 games and scoring two goals with the New York Islanders, including his first ever NHL goal against the Canucks. So it's <laughs> so, a fun little fact now. And then, uh, yeah, Anthony Bellevillier. Hey, I said his name right because I butchered it a few times on this podcast. Practice makes perfect. Yeah, uh, he's just a uh, he's 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 25 years old. Um, I I think he's probably got another level offensively in him, uh, especially if he play uh, out from under the uh, Barry Trotz, Lou Lamorello tight system. I know talk it's, they're trying to install a little bit of that with the Talkit, but I think it it's going to be a little looser than than that system. So I think we might we could see him be a um, to bump up his offensive numbers with the Canucks this year. Um, but the, it, to me, the, the very interesting one is that first round pick. And because where the Islanders are at, they're two points out of the wild card spot right now. And even if they make it, they're going to be in a wild card spot, which means there's a good chance they're playing Boston. And if they're out, that's still that's the Canucks are looking at. I think even as long as they're a wild card team, the Canucks are still picking between 13th and 17th with that pick in 2023. But if they miss the playoffs and they have a top 12 pick, it rolls over to 2024. And when you look at this Islanders roster, it's old. And could that be a pick that could turn into what the Flames had to deal with, with the Hominick trade, where the Islanders got Dobson with a a high pick and had to go through the lottery uh, craziness there. Florida might be doing that this year. Um, And then you had San Jose and Ottawa and Colorado all within – dealing with that in the past as well, where they traded away or got received uh, protected picks that turned into unprotected um, first round picks in the year after where the, was it the Carlson trade where 
Um, Ottawa ended up with two top five picks in in the draft. Uh, Colorado got Bowen Byram out of that. So it's that's the that's the very that's the interesting one for me is what happens with that first round pick because this is a this is a deep deeper draft than than what we than than we're what we we're used to uh, according to a lot of the experts. So there could be someone there that could be a who would be potentially a top ten talent in any other draft. So that's in a, if they get a like thirteenth fourteenth overall, which would be very good for the Canucks. But if they end up with a 2024 draft draft pick and it's higher, wow. Yeah, uh, the island. I I wonder. I just just from the Islanders' perspective, I was listening briefly to an Islanders podcast, and they hate this trade with a passion. Um, it's uh, they don't uh, they don't think Bo's going to sign. Uh, and they think they gave up. They did absolutely did not want to give up Ratu. They absolutely did not want to give up a first round pick. So from the Islanders' perspective, they're not happy about this trade. So that's probably a good sign for the Canucks. Um, and I just wonder where the Islanders are. You're right. I think 2024. I agree. This is a very interesting situation. But and I wonder what the island if the Islanders are going to try to pull the Columbus of a 2018 19 and try to throw all of their chips in to see if they can they can get a run out of this even even though they're in a wild card spot. Oh, I thought you meant they're going to try and snipe somebody from Calgary last minute. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, Phillips is the next shortest guy, so they can sign him to 10 million over in the island. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, what are your thoughts? It's not where I expected Horvat to end up. I think that, um, you know, when you're looking at teams, and this very much reminds me the Islanders of sort of a, where the Flames are right now, sort of that fringe playoff team. And I think that they're putting a lot in to try and win this year. And we, we talked about this last night on Fireside Chat. Should the Flames do the same? I expected Horvat to either go as a rental somewhere you know, that was to a team that was much higher in the standings or sort of a, a, a trade and sign, like trade and they'd already have a long-term deal done. I don't see them staying on the island. And I think it's, I think that the Islanders are mortgaging a lot and they're not going to get much out of it. This sort of reminds me of the the Flames deal for uh, Yarn Croak last year. Like the Flames gave up a lot for a guy that really didn't move the needle. And I'm, I'm not saying Yarn Croak and Horvat are, comparable but i just think he's not going to move the needle a lot in long island not enough because i think there's a lot more things that they need as well i agree and you know it, it when i first saw it it was weird to me i'm like why well, had top 12 protected but sean you're right when i dug into it it's because that's probably where they're going to be in the standings usually we see top 10 protected i don't think we've ever seen a 12 before yeah uh Oh, now ahead. the only thing you know, I and I, I guess it becomes to I don't I think that I also don't know that Vancouver got enough here. Like when I was looking at Vancouver's return, I thought to myself, really, that's it. I was kind of expecting either more picks or a bigger name roster player. Well, I guess the question would be, would you have? And I, you know, I think that there's two sides to this argument, and I'm really, to be honest with you, not sure where I sit. Um, which is good podcasting skill, but I'm going to be, I'll be honest. I don't know where I sit. Do you allow the team to negotiate an extension or do you just go, okay, you deal with Bo Horvat. Thank you very much. I think you could get more if you allow them to negotiate an extension. So I would. <clears throat> what, what if Bo said, no, thanks you to the Islanders. I'm sure there's somebody out there that would take him that would want to extend him. Or if not, I mean, the deadline's coming. If it was me, I'd probably, and maybe this is why I'm not an NHL GM except on my Xbox, um, you know, I would probably let him shop around, see who he wants to sign an extension for if nobody, then swing back around and say, okay, now we're looking at a rental market. What would you give us for a rental? I, I just look at that and what, like, what, what, what's the standard sort of rental price for a top-end player? A first... 
a prospect That's and true. a younger yeah, roster and, and you really kind of got three firsts in this, if you will. I mean, that's what Alvin said. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's interesting too, because this now sets the market price for this year. We're always waiting for that first domino to drop. Yeah, I just, yeah, I think it's, it, I think there there's always this like hope that your your GM can swindle someone else in these deals. But it's, there's two there's two parties at play, and especially if you're dealing with Lou. <laughs> like, um, I I just looked I look at that deal and it's it's on par. It's yep. it's 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 on par for what 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 top like sort of top six players get, other than like like pure bona fide superstars. Essentially a top six forward, especially a center, is going to get a first a prospect. I guess. And a roster I guess maybe when I said I was expecting a little bit more, I was kind of expecting there would be a conditional pick if he signed. You know, something like okay, yeah. if he signs here, then you get a you know a second or we've seen those kind of things done at the draft before. And I think maybe the fact that didn't happen tells you they're not expecting that signing. Yeah, and I think and part I of that, a part of that, I think a part of that is also with has to do with with that first round pick. I think that first, the fact that if Bo Horvat doesn't re-sign with the Islanders, say, say the Islanders miss the playoffs, they they have like the twelfth, eleventh or twelfth overall pick, so they they keep it. And then Bo's like, screw this, I'm not I'm not staying here. I'm going to go to another team that I think is is better set up here. Islanders aren't aren't in any better position. They could end up with uh the the Canucks could end up with a better pick. It's true. And you know, this is the kind of deal I look at and go, was that the best offer that was available, or was that like the only team they talked to? Like it just I don't know. It it seems like there's other teams that might have offered more. Well, maybe, but it, it all comes down to how you evaluate the the players, like the rest. That's true. The, the the Ratus and the Bavilliers there, because I think I know that the Ratu Ratu is like. He, and, he's a player who, and has I think Ratu's going to end up being the key piece of this. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Like, I'll, I mean, it, him or that first round pick, depending on what happens with it, are going to be yeah. the key piece, like the key piece, if not both at the same time. Isn't there thirty one other teams? That, oh, hello, uh, hello, that, Look that, at that are a part of this. Hold well, on, know, Chicago's what, what number, what number team, of the Royal so Rumble? You just run in. You run in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it I, took I, him a while to do his entrance. I got, I got one beer here. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't have any other beers, so I can't be stone cold. I, I, I can try my best, but that's okay. You I, can, I need you some can, glass we'll, breaking. Let's we'll call you lukewarm. <laughs> lukewarm, <laughs> which that's is totally okay. Bro. Yeah, yeah, because my 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 takes are very lukewarm. There you go. <laughs> Well, hello, Devin. For those who are listening, who don't, who have no idea who this guy just jumped in on the stream yard here, and how are you? I uh, listen. It's a big day in hockey, especially for our podcast, and I, I, I don't, I don't know what to think of this trade. I really have no idea what to think, and because like I, I jumped in and I heard Dan talk about how that was this the only offer that they had or was this the best offer that they had is this the time that they should do it i don't i, I don't know i don't know well, well I, I think that's a, that's a fair sort of thought there and yeah it, it, at at first glance it does feel a little sort of underwhelming and i think, I think as a non canucks fan i'm maybe looking at it from a more distance approach um but it's I look at I do yeah I just I'm I'm not sure what else like yeah I think Boston was apparently interested, um, Seattle was but I never thought they were they had what the Canucks were looking for. Um, Carolina was but I think the Canucks with Boston and Can and and Carolina the Canucks were eyeing players that they that were on the roster there on both those teams that both those teams didn't want to give up. And which made it a little tougher to to make those those deals. So, well, Being and Canucks the, fans, you guys tell me, but it just feels weird that they got two forwards. Like it feels like the thing that Canucks need is a defenseman. Well, that could be that. That could be that's what that first round pick could turn well, into. 
let, let me let me answer that question. This is was my theory because I thought about this. It would have been Noah Dobson, but you're not getting a first if you're getting Noah Dobson. There's no. just no way that that's happening. I'd rather take Noah Dobson. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I would too, but I don't, I actually don't think it, I don't think he was on the even on the table. He probably I don't think wasn't. he was. No. How about Travis Hamanick? Hey, Flames fans. Would we would we like Noah Dobson? Do we, do we have to move the the first round picks back to uh, compensate? Yeah, for we that? have to re- do a time reversal here. The, the, the uh, Z on that trade. Yeah, uh, that yeah. Um, but I also the other thing that I think is important here. I think I wonder how much they wanted to just get this jump on because they got a lot more work to do. You've got the Brock Besser situation. You've got Connor Garland. You may be trading Thatcher Demko. That may be on the table by the trade deadline, which is a head, a bit of a head. I'm not gonna lie, it's a head scratcher to me, but okay, we'll see what I happens. Mean, on maybe that. if they get the right offer, I think they're they're just again, I think they're doing due diligence on that one. And That's Kevin, probably- I think you you might be honest on there. I think by establishing the market price early, they're also establishing their own roster prices. Yep. Yeah, but that seems more like a off season trade than a trade deadline, right? Yeah. Uh, Demko, what, yeah. What, what 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 Demko? Yeah, goalie, but not best- who would be a 1A within this league, if not a number one, be traded at the trade deadline. I don't think that's ever been done, has it? Ryan Miller. Fleury well, last he's year. Not an, oh, man. Marc-Andre Fleury last year. Yeah, but the, like we're talking about Demko, who's in his mid-20s, not comparison to uh, guys who were previously number ones. And no, right, are now... we're, we're talking Ryan Miller back in the day when he got traded from Buffalo to St. Louis. How old was he? Is my point. Right? Mid twenty. He was mid to late twenties. He wasn't I that th- old. I think he was okay. If we're talking about late twenties, he's probably twenty nine. I think Maybe. Anthony Miami, when he was on top of his game, got traded at the deadline one year. What was it to Dallas? I think. I, that was that was uh, post cup though, was it not? Yeah, but still on top of his game. I mean, let's be honest. Um, you know, Demko's okay. post cup too. He's not going to the cup anytime soon in Vancouver. Demko's post cup? <laughs> Wait, I love he's pre cup. He didn't know what he's, a cup. <laughs> he's won a cup at some point in his life. He won the midget cup somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> he won a coffee cup. Maybe he won a co- 1980. I saw him leaving the drive through his post Jimmy's cup. We're we're splitting membranes. Is that is that is that it? Or are we splitting elephants? One of the two. I don't know. Maybe. He was thirty four when he was traded to St. Louis. Who? Uh, Ryan Miller. 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 Yeah, thirty four. But my my whole point is that Demko is what uh, 24, 25? 27. and it feels like he's younger. But yeah, it, I don't know. And you guys can prove me wrong. Um, instead, of, instead of just grasping the straws, if we could, I'm, I'm talking about this. How I know, like I, I know fucking something, but I don't. <laughs> it feels like this is this would be a one off if that's the case. I don't think that Demko. I don't think Demko gets deadline. moved to the deadline. I think Besser no, does yeah. though, and I think this helps sure. establish the market price for Besser. I think the, the 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 two other trades that are happening are a trade of a winger, most likely Besser. And, and Luke Shen, the AHL defenseman right now, Luke Shen. <laughs> Who Maybe could he'll go back come to, to Calgary? <laughs> oh, I come to Calgary for fuck's sakes! That'd be great. You know, Tre Living likes to go out and get his depth defenseman of the deadline. <laughs> yes, hey, he's a better. He's better than Mark. Uh, Mark Mike Stone, right now. <laughs> The other stone, the the brothers. It drives, yeah, I've, uh, it's, I don't it's know, Dan, if you know this podcast unless Devin runs in and then mix, mixes the names of Mike and Mark Stone. Uh, yet, yet the the Stone, the Strom brothers. You have the Stahl brothers, the Quinn, you know, Jack Hugh brothers. I don't know. They could see there's a lot of brothers in this league. Maybe we just need to start doing like China and a one child per family policy just for Devin. <laughs> You're going to play hockey one child per family. Please. Yeah. But let's make this easy on me. <laughs> you, you know, the, the, sorry, the one thing I really want to stress on, though, is flip on the other side of things as far as this um, uh, Horvat trade goes. How does, like, yes, you, for the Islanders, you improve your top six 
but do you really improve your chances of making the playoffs? <laughs> I, that's what that? I, Devin, what I'm saying is I wonder if they're going to pull, try to do what Columbus did a few years ago and just go all in and make some, some, and make some wacky trades. But what, what do you have? What, what capital do you have within that organization? I'm sorry. I think Lou has, I think Lou has dirt on other general managers. That's what I think Lou has. (laughs) I, he's hey, old, you know what? And he, I think he, I, I, I'm half, I'm honestly joking when I'm saying this. Maybe he's part of like some sort of, like, like Lou is a, Lou's a crafty guy. Lou may know some information here because he keeps things all kind of quiet and comes in for the kill. But I think Lou's in it. I, I think the Islanders are in a very desperate situation. You guys think that Lamarello looks like a crib keeper? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he could. Lou looks but happy he, with he, the trade today, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you have you have nine uh you, you have ten players on your team right now that are over 30. Yeah. Ten so, players. I mean, and granted, like it's if, if we're going down the road of potentially bringing Horvat back, you have 16 million dollars. You only have Varlamov and uh Scott Mayfield as your UFAs. Which does bode well uh, as far as Lou, Lou uh, Lamorella goes for bringing back Bo Horvat, but I, just, I I don't see Horvat signing back there, so I'm very skeptical in this trade of if you are an Islanders fan. I I don't know if I'd be up I'd be happy with it because there's no certainty within this. No. No, and you're right. They don't have a lot of assets for rental. I mean, there's guys I wouldn't mind from that team, but I'm not paying a king's ransom for them. What Zach Parise? Is, is he? You know, I, I, think, <laughs> I think there's value in Josh Bailey if you could get part of his uh, salary retained. I think there's uh, some value in Sezakis. He's got a long term 2.5. I think you know um, Ryan, you know Ryan Pulak, but they're not moving him. No, nobody wants Adam Pellick. Um, you know, Scott Mayfield, I think, might have some value, but if they're trying to add, they're not going to get rid of those pieces, right? If they're trying to go all in, they're not getting rid of anything. And that that's that's the whole thing is that even looking at your – I mean, they, they have every single uh, round draft pick except for the first round that they just sold off to Vancouver. But what, what type of capital does that have within – okay – your your top six has a hole in it. I'm sorry. When you have, as far as daily faceoff goes, you have Josh Bailey, who's been on the fourth line, if not playing less than 15 minutes a night with Bo Horvat and Matthew yeah. Barzal. Uh, I, I, I I just don't I don't see the logical sense that behind would, that, they would bringing have to in do what Bo the Horvat. Flames did last year and start selling all their picks. I mean, remember last year between Toffoli and. Um, and you know, the other guys they brought in, they pretty much sold all their, you know, top three picks in the next five years. That's the, this smells to me like a desperation move from a GM who does not have a future or potentially and, doesn't. And is a win. Yeah, now and we mode, don't know which, if Lou's on the hot seat there. Uh, it's, it feels like it with this. It rate. feels like it to me. Yeah. And he had, a, they had a horrible off season. Remember they could, they didn't get Kadri. They didn't get anybody. Um, they ended up whatever happened at the draft table between Vancouver and the Islanders. We never know, but there was apparently we there were reports that there was a trade on the table. They acquired Alexander Romanoff, and I don't know if they come away with that feeling all that happy because they gave away a first round pick, if I am not mistaken, in that trade. Yeah. So um, you, you have a good goaltender with a year left after this year at four million dollars, who will get paid the goddamn world. And I, you, you know, you you do have Lou Lamarillo at the helm there, so he'll probably nickel and dime him until the goddamn end. But outside of that, you have extensions that uh, Pulak Pelic uh, just made, along with Barzal, Jeff, which he's you not had nickel to and dime him. He's paying nineteen seventies money, which is what he's used to. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. My point is that you, you have a young goaltender, you have a good young defenseman, and Noah Han or sorry, Noah Hanfin. Noah Dobson, and you also have Matthew Barzal, and now you have uh, Horvat, which is which is fantastic. But God, he, 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 the the amount of money that he's going to be spending within the next 
X amount of years, three years at minimum with Anders Lee, who is on the, on the decline for another three years at $7 million. Uh, JG Pazio for another three years at $5 million. And uh, Casey Zizekas at two point five. Both All three of those players are good players, but not at that time. Not that money. Bo Horvat at 27 is the second youngest forward on that team. Which is unreal. <laughs> so, I think I, we can like, all agree Bo's not going back. I don't think I don't, so. If, if, I'm if, Bo I, Horvat, if, I, if I'm Bo Horvat, I'm, I'm waiting to see how this – what. Yeah. There, there will be a lot of teams that want him. Um, there will be teams I, that maybe wanted him now but didn't have the assets to make it and work. I, but, and I think to go back to Long Island, they're going to have to pay a premium to get them to, to endure that. I mean, that's not a team that's on the upward swing. I and mean, that's a team that's on the downward swing. And that is a horrible arena situation. That is a disaster of an arena situation. Like it's a two hour commute to get to that rink in New York. Yep. So and, like and uh, let alone, let yeah. alone the fact that you have, you're you're in your prime, and you have a GM who really just holds his money close to his vest. It just it like the, the situation doesn't make sense to me. I'm sorry. Old people hold their money close to their vest. That's what they were used to back in the recession days. <laughs> Don't give them a raise. Give them a Worthers. Yeah. <laughs> Boo Burns. They're, they're at the UBS Boo. Arena now at, by Belmont. Not a great that. location. It's not a great, great location. It's, like, it's better than like when they were out in. in everything's Nat- better than the basketball Austin. rink, Sean. And, and and way better than yeah the the basketball rink in, in Brooklyn. Well, like I know I came in a little bit late, but like the the return also going the other way, I just don't feel is. I feel like that's they could have gotten more. That's what I said. It felt a little light. Yeah, I, I and I, I felt that way a little bit too. But the the structured structure matches what what other play other players of, of similar ilk have gotten. It just comes down to a what happens with that first round pick and 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 what happens with Atu Ratu, because I think that's that's the one. It's like At, Atu Ratu isn't your bona fide blue chip prospect. That's what normally you get in in these deals that makes that makes it feel enough. You knew they were going to get a first round pick. You knew they were going to get sort of a a roster player that would just sort of make the the cap work. And I think they got a better roster player than maybe they could have in, in Bavillier. But it's the yeah, it's the it's the fact that Atu Ratu just doesn't scream blue chip prospect right now. So let me ask you guys this as Canucks fans. Do you feel like the Canucks because there's always teams that have to go into a rebuild but sort of don't want to admit it. Do you think the Canucks are admitting that they need that first-round pick and it's rebuild time, or do you think they might try to move that pick for a roster player and try to sort of retool on the fly? No, they, they, they've they admitted to major surgery. Okay. Yeah. They've, they've admitted. And the, the other thing is that you're putting me in this umbrella as a Canucks fan there, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. Talking Canucks, Canucks fans. Fan. Yeah, no. Listen, I no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the only reason I could see I'm just doing the research here into Horvat that he might want to go back to Long Island is he could pull the Johnny Goudreau. Well, it's close to home. It's on the same coast as where he's from <laughs> in Rodney, Ontario. I can't go home, but I can go close. Yeah, yeah. I can't go anywhere near my actual home, but I'm close to home. Closer. Yeah. I'm closer to home. You're in the same time zone. Good I'm good on same- you, Bo. Yeah. But even though Bo had no idea where the hell he was going, <laughs> no. But in the summer when he, he picked, found out, Michael he was at Disneyland when he found out too. Was he? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the the only pushback I have towards Bavillier is that he's been a, a half a point per game per player, or uh, player for two of the past four years, and those two years were uh, the the prior two years to the past two years. So my my and Rutherford was talking about how he wanted to get a reclamation project that hasn't worked out in other places that he could potentially get more out of within Vancouver and good on him for getting Bavillier, but at the same time I feel I, I just I, I don't know I let if let's let's use Lou's uh, mantra if you have time use it. And especially when it comes to, down to the, the the crunch of the 
uh, trade deadline, why the fuck wouldn't you wait for another, what, three weeks? See, see what, what comes down the pipe? Because Bo Horvat is at the number one spot as far as I'm concerned or was for a – a player that's going to be moved and especially Boston. God, how scary would Boston be with Bo Horvat down the center? I guess the only thing I'm thinking is maybe Lou knows something we don't. And maybe the trade market, we've seen this in the past where the trade market kind of stalls until one guy moves. So maybe he felt he needed to make that move now to get things going. Or is he thinking about potentially uh, trading him (laughs) at the trade deadline, you know, and, and try to think if, if Lou wants to make a lot of big deals, he might have been talking to people and they said, Well, we're not going to do a deal till Horvat goes. Okay, well, then let's make Horvat go. Maybe. Maybe There's yeah, a lot of, yeah. lot, of, lot of potential within this. And I, I'm all for fucking chaos, especially when it comes to not my two favorite teams. It, uh, it, it really, I, I think it's very intriguing because you, you wouldn't have expected the Islanders to be a part of this. Yeah, I it's yeah. I agree with that. It's, well, it'll uh, be interesting. It'll be interesting. I believe I think... uh, Lou Lamoureux did say that they're going to try their best to to get a long term deal, and they're going to start working on it now, which will be interesting. Um, as well as yeah, Friedman says he doesn't believe that this is a short term. Uh, but if I'm Bo, player. I'm not signing until I know how we do in the playoffs. Yeah, if you get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he might, I mean, they might work on a deal and he might say, sure, if we get to this round, you can fax in this deal. But I don't think yeah. anything gets done if, you know, they don't make it past second round. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's leave the bow conversation for now. I think that we've, there's a lot more to unpack. I think there'll be a lot more by the, where the Islanders right now, just one other. Whether or not Bo will play in the all-star game. Oh yeah, that's the only other thing. Yeah, yeah, I I could care less to be honest with you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is he going? As far as like I I, I listen, I have extensive knowledge within the NHL atmosphere, but who the fuck is going? <laughs> this is the one year I felt the most disconnected from the All Star game. Like we didn't get to pick. We we're just told these are your All Stars for the year. Deal with it. Well, then 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 there was like the Twitter vote, which was just, just spammed everyone's. Uh, Twitter feeds with the hashtags. But I don't think Ugh. anybody cared at that point because it just felt like we were yeah. voting for the leftovers. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? Edmonton? Who cared? Stuart Skinner? Who? Skinner! <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, he, he, like, like, granted, Skinner was really good for the first quarter of the year, but then this last quarter has been kind of very much mediocre, and he's still going to the All-Star game. I don't know. It, it's, it's, just, it's interesting. Well, if he yeah. keeps looking mediocre, maybe the emergency goalie will take his spot. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good old, good old e-bug. Mm. E-bug. Mm. All right. Let's let's hop to the let's hop to the flames here. Um, that's uh, not that you know we could spend more hours on this, but I, I I mean we're here to talk some flames. We haven't had Devin Sean get into some of our conversation that Dan and I had last night, and I want to kind of go back. And start with what happened, not this Saturday, but the Saturday before, when Jacob Pelche finally made his debut with the Calgary Flames. And he gets the skate. He gets the family is all there. He's on a line with Trevor Lewis and Walker Dewar against Tampa Bay. They provide a hell of a lot of energy. They play their best game of the year against the Tampa Bay Lightning, or one of their best games of the year, and in a 6-3 to three victory. But what are we talking about? What is we his are... number? Is exactly. that what we're talking about? Yeah. yeah. Daryl Sutter, after that, comments on what's his number, and it's a long way to go for a 20-year-old, 1-year-old to play in the National Hockey League. And I think it really sets – this the flames fan base off i think and i want to start here because since that press conference there has been a very different daryl sutter presenting themselves to the media eric francis wrote a column about it on sportsnet.ca uh john bean the president of the calgary flames who was rarely one that is able is that has been noted in public probably in public more often, 
happened to be the, at the arena during practice on Monday. So I discussed this with Dan yesterday on the fireside chat, and maybe we'll get everyone's perspective. I think that Daryl Sutter had a little bit of a talking to by someone after those conversa- that conversation with Jacob Pelche. And I do not think that that sat well with the organization at all. And as much as ownership loved, loves Daryl Sutter, I, I think he, he did not hit the right button and someone had a chat with him. And I would, I, I, my theory is either, either Brad had to go and have that conversation and John said, you better talk to him or I wouldn't even be surprised if some of the veteran players said that was wrong. Well, the, I was listening to the Eric Francis show on 960 and he, or and on uh, on the Merrick show, and he all he had to say was that a lot of veteran players, a lot of players, said that uh, towards him. Good on you for, and it, it was his very Eric Francis is saying the the entire interview with Merrick was just him praising uh, 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 Eric Francis praising his own self for the fact that he said this towards. Um, Daryl Sutter and uh, challenged him essentially, which is a whole different other thing. But the you, you, you're probably right. There is a bunch of people within this organization, players, management, owners, that weren't happy with the way that he presented himself, and it it was very old school, and it, it really didn't it it didn't sit well with me. I know that, and the I would say a good ninety to ninety five percent of the fans of the Calgary Flames it, it it we are past this point of being very passive within rookies and how they're treated and players in general on how they're treated you know they the I thought it was very interesting that Pelche said to a French um Quebec newspaper that Daryl went uh, and talked to him separately before he had the press conference saying you played well. And that was, that's, that's through Jacob Pelche that he played well and that he was happy with his performance, but it was more so a fuck you to the media as far as I'm concerned. And like, it's just, just, just play the goddamn game. Uh, like Daryl Sutter, play the game. Like the, the, the media is there to ask questions. So answer them. Honestly, answer them correctly. You're here. You're getting paid. Don't be a goddamn dick. I'm well, sorry. Well, there are guys that are known like, you know, Tortorella to be anti-media. And Daryl's never really been that way. I mean, Daryl's not the most talkative guy. I mean, you ask Conroy a question, you get 25 minutes on, you know, did you like your Coke? And he tells you some story from one night in New York. That's not Daryl, but don't be a dick. Yeah, he's def- he was definitely like almost doing his own like Torx impression. And I feel like he's been playing. He's been playing with the media a lot this year, and I just I don't I don't know why. Like he, I think he maybe he just is bored with this whole the the whole dog and pony show that is the media for for coaches. I and, think and I understand players. what he was trying to do. I just think he did it incorrectly, and I think Daryl is trying to shield Peltier a little bit. And we saw this even yep. before Peltier played. And I think he's trying to get some of the media attention off Peltier so Peltier doesn't have too much attention on him. And the media is looking at him as the savior of this team or something like that. But I don't think he did it the right way. But it, and it's also right on brand with with Daryl in terms of like the tone that he's handled mm-hmm. every young player since he's come in. Whether it was Valimaki, whether it was Rajitska, whether it was Phillips, whether it, now we got Pelche, he's always been very very much, yeah, doing that. Whether it is to deflect the attention, um, make sure that they don't have a big head coming up into the into the into the NHL or whatever. He's always had this sort of just tough external um, sort of approach to the to the kids, which is in some point is fine. But if I'm oops, if I'm Matthew Coronado and I'm yeah. hearing that, 
do I say, wow, this is the guy that I want to go play with? Or do I say, you know what, I'm going to pull an Adam Fox and go somewhere else? Like, I think, you know, it's one thing to say it to Jacob on his own, but you've got to put that front out for the media too. Or if I'm a young guy that's going to be drafted this year and I go, well, I don't want to go to Calgary now. Well, what what is uh, what has Adam Fox done? Oh, wait, defenseman of the year. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks. I'll just take a step back here and uh, yeah, I mean, or, if yeah. I, or if I'm Dustin Wolf and I say, well, geez, what's going to happen when they call me up? Maybe I should not renew there, right? Totally. And like, I, I think Kevin, the the way that you, you you presented this question, I think, is very valid. And the fact that yeah, there's a lot of Calgary Flames organization people who aren't up, who aren't happy with the way that he presented himself. And Dan, I think, I think you having time to reflect on my last podcast, cause I was fucking heated about Daryl Sutter and the way that he was conducting himself. I, it, it does resonate with me that he was trying to protect uh, Jacob Pelche and uh, making sure that his head doesn't, his head doesn't get too big so he can walk through uh, the, the front door into the dressing room. Right. Um, but it, you, you got to do it the right way, especially within this, uh, this era that we are in within media, within the, the culture and the game and making sure that players understand why they're doing certain things and that, that, that they're praised and they're, they're loved in the, in, in, in a certain way, because and I think Daryl could have achieved the same thing by saying he had a good first night. He did what we expected as a fourth line player done. Yeah. Yep. He's 21. He's still got work to do. Yep. Yeah. You know okay. what? We put him on the fourth line. He did what we asked. He had limited minutes because we had some penalty troubles. That's all you got to say. Yeah. And I, I also wonder if Daryl's just tired. Like maybe he's listening too much to the noise um, and, and tired of like all the noise about Phillips, about Pelche, and about how, why isn't he playing the kids? And that might have been him fighting back again, not in the right way or even something that he should be doing. But I wonder if that's part of it. Well, we've well, had, why, we've why is Lucci on, on that? Oh, go ahead, Devin. Oh, uh, just why is Lucci on that second line? Yeah, it, yeah. it's it, it's it, it. There's been a lot of questions about how he's deployed his troops and uh, why there are certain players on certain lines, and um, it, it's just it, it it's constant. And so I can understand from his standpoint why he was very agitated within that question. And he, but like at the same time, you got to be but expecting he it on that himself. exactly. Yes. You know, we've asked the question on Fireside Chat a few times. I'd be curious to hear what you guys think. You know, we saw Phillips come up and not really play. We saw Peltier come up and not really play. Do you think there's a rift between management and the coach where Brad is saying, I'm bringing this guy up for the road trip and Dell says, fine, I'm not going to play him. Like, you know, generally they'd be on the same page of who do you want up. And I almost wonder if the Walker Dewar call up was a, you know, sort of to pacify Daryl. I think that, yeah, you, you, you... The skeptical side of me says that Daryl is very petty <laughs> and saying, like you said, that, you know, yeah, if you can bring him up. I'm not going to fucking play him. Yep. And Just to show you, I'm not going to play him. Exactly. And that, that's been the narrative or that was a narrative for at least three weeks before Pelche got, or I, I guess, like a week and a half ago. And again, Daryl um, could have avoided all the questions by just playing the kid. Like I feel sure. like Daryl brought this on himself. But he, but, he the, the amount of the, the ego that's on Daryl, the fact that he just won coach of the year puts pressure on him, whether or not he wants to admit it or not, as far as I'm concerned. And it's it just, it, it it's not necessary. No. What is be- what What's better? What's bigger? The team that you always talk about, the veterans that you always talk about, or is about getting W's as he's talked about before in the past. And it, it I, I, I'm very curious to see how this next little bit before the trade deadline really goes. Because is he going to force Bradshaw Living's hand to to make a big swing and get uh, you know a mediocre middle six winger of Vladimir Tarasenko in um, and spend all that capital to get a, a, a big player in, or how about you, you save a little bit of money? You save us. You save some capital and let Pelche fucking run with it. Yeah, I think, or I doer think for that matter. You had you had the right word and ego there, Dev. I think I don't think that I don't think there's pettiness. I think Daryl's too too competitive for that. I think it's more he just thinks he it's not pettiness. He just thinks he knows better. I think that's what it is. He like 
they'll they'll talk and they'll say and then brad will say yeah well i'm bringing up uh phillips or pelche or whatever and then he'll go okay well i'm still just gonna play the players that i think are gonna give us the best chance to win which is lucci and... on the second line that's how you win lord stanley's mug gross <laughs> <laughs> again i just think he he's he he thinks that's the way it is right now and Maybe long, I think he knows long term that's not the answer, but right now, for whatever reason, he thinks that it's working. We've been asking this question since Christmas on our show. Do you think maybe it's time to move on from this head coach? Who the fuck they you bring just in? Signed into a new deal. Who, Coaches who are, are hired to be in? fired. They, yeah, I don't. Hard to be fired, Sean, like, I don't think he'd be fired. I think the Flames optically wouldn't fire him. He would become special assistant to the Zamboni driver, something else where they keep him around, but not in a coaching position. Special assistant to David Ayers. Awesome. Special assistant to the, you know, the special consultant for the Wranglers. I don't know. Because, you know, you want them to evaluate all your young guys. Um, yeah, I, I think I, if I you make know. the trade, I think if you make the change mid-year, you have to give Kirk Muller the job. But I think there's enough yes. guys in the offseason. You could look at a guy like Elaine Vino. I think there's enough guys out there, you know, whoever lose their job in the off season that if the flames want to spend the money, which has always been their issue, they don't need another Glenn Gullitson and as their coach, no. but if they're willing to spend the money and there's enough guys that they could bring in. There is yeah, see, there, there, there's the, there's your, there's your, uh, there, there's, there's your, the, the crux and everything there is, are they willing to spend the money? Cause I don't think they are. I think they're going to stick it out for, for Daryl for the rest of this season and then going into the season after and see what happens. Are they still paying uh, other coaches? I believe the Jeff Ward is still being paid. Jeff Ward is still being paid. This isn't a, an ownership group that loves to pay coaches. We know this. It, 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 like it's, it's, the, the, the test is true as time. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm personally curious. Brower what Kevin head thinks. coach. Who'd rather pay for it? Not pay for it. <laughs> hey, you want a cup? W's. I can find your coach that has a cup too. <laughs> this is this is where I this is where I'm at. I I think as stubborn as Daryl has been, I also think that deep down in his heart, I think after the Colorado game, um, and even after some of what has happened in this first half of the year, um, he knows this team. What he has done isn't working. And I think we're going to see a different I, I maybe it's just me being optimistic, but I do think we're gonna see a different Daryl in the second half of the year. Um which means I think we see Pelche with Kadri and Huberdo. Um which Long mean, term? yeah. I think for their I I think Pelche is with the team for as long as the planes are in the playoff mix. Um I I honestly think that that I think Daryl, Daryl's stubbornness, I think he, you know, you can't look at what Jacob Pelche, you, you go look back at that Chicago game, that there was one guy that showed up other than Markstrom, one guy that truly showed up and played like that game mattered, and that was Pelche. And I think that that's starting to, this team needs something different, and I think Daryl knows it. They, it needs a different form of energy. It needs a different life. And I think as stubborn as Daryl could be, he also knows what's working and what's not. I think Daryl's going to keep Peltier there as long as Peltier earns that spot. But I think yeah. Peltier is going to be on a really short leash. It's going to be the shortest leash that's ever leashed. <laughs> well, it's probably a cow <laughs> leash, right? Yeah, like, it's probably like, for like sure. probably that that. But I he, like, that, that's what he's spending his nine days doing on the farm is making this leash, cutting leather and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my bit my biggest thing is making like the why not promote him when he was doing like the the first half of his very very first game he was phenomenal. The fact like that there was I have vivid memories of Trevor Lewis trying to corral a puck that was very easy to corral and it would have been a two on one with Pelche the other way. You know, it, it's surrounding him to make him succeed and giving him the opportunity. Yes, okay, don't like don't don't make Pelche scared that if like once he makes a mistake that he's not gonna be able to to stay on that line, right? But give him the confidence of being like, Hey, listen, kid, 
I understand that you're you're young and that you're you have a bunch of piss and vinegar. You've done a lot within the AHL, but I'm not gonna like if you fuck up once, I'm not gonna bench you. I'm not gonna put you down on the fourth line again. And I really hope that 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 is the the facade behind the the media bullshit that he's he's uh, he's putting forward in front of us. That's my biggest worry. Well, I also think that Pelche found an advocate in that dressing room in Jonathan Huberdeau, who's taken Pelche under his wing. There's a friendship there, and I do think that that plays something into that. He's the perfect size to be under uh, Jonathan's wing as well. Yeah, exactly. They're you know, but and you know, French Canadian, maybe, and they're mm-hmm. yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, no, and I think you're right, Kevin. I think that might be the reason that he stays there, especially, you know, Daryl puts so much stock in his veterans. If the veterans say, I want to play with the kid, he'll probably stay there. Well, and I some think of these veterans he probably that... starts there. It, yeah, I, I agree with Devin. It's a, it'll be a short leash. And even, even if he starts the game there, <laughs> yeah, you have Ruzichka who, who's, who's shown well at times. And then, the pull pull in case of emergency Lucic. Well, and even I mean, yeah. look at look at Dylan Dubé, right? D- Daryl said for years he wasn't enamored with Dubé, and he criticized Dubé, and now Dubé is his first line guy. And I think you know, there's no way that a new kid is going to usurp that, even if he's the better player, because I think Daryl's going to say, "Well, Dubé, you know, I finally trust." So I think that we know what Peltier's ceiling is on the team this year. Can I throw another wrench into this conversation, though? Sure. You signed Huberto for how long? Eight years after this year. You signed Kadri for how long? Seven. S- seven six years. years. Yeah. Six years. You signed this. Uyghur for how long? Five years after this year? Six Something years? Like that. I, I cannot imagine that those three do not have some sort of influence in saying, look, this is... I've signed here for eight fucking years, seven fucking years, six fucking years. You're not going to waste my time with your games. And there have been reports, and I'm going to say this, reports that some veterans have had to, in L.A., even when L.A. have said, look, Daryl, you need to smarten the fuck up. I'm not, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something like that happens in this dressing room. This is a team that has cup aspirations. They're not cup contenders this year. That's not what I'm saying. But this isn't, you know, you put all this money in. You asked me to come here to Calgary. And I, you, yeah, you're, I'm getting a hell of a lot of money. But you need to put me in a situation where I can win. But again, I think that goes down, down to are they asking Daryl to smarten up? Or are they going to Brad saying, if this guy's not going to do it, find a different guy? And, and I he, really think he, it's going to come down to one of them is going to have to go in the offseason, either Brad or Daryl. I think, yeah. You're talking about it, it, you talk about uh, Brad who doesn't have a contract for next year, and they have Daryl for another two years after this. It's it, it's it's hard to really have that like fine of a line, which I like. But within, if they're within, if within, they within saying doing, that, if they have two different options or outlooks on this team. You can't keep them both around. No, but you, you, you're look, you're looking at Brad Tree Living, who's been here for how long? Is is it almost a decade yep. <laughs> that he's been here? Right, it, it, eight years. And what, what has he done, right? Well, I, I guess it depends how you look at it. I, I don't think we can argue that Brad has put the right players on the ice most years, and that's his job. Yep. Right? What they do on the ice is the coach's job. But I think if we look at Brad, even if you look at this last summer, I don't think another GM could have done as good a job. I think when we look at Brad, even yep. the years they've underperformed, the Flames have had the right guys on the roster. And I, I agree with you. And, I mean <laughs> – how many times have I run on because Sean has been uh, dissing on uh, on the GM of the <laughs> Calgary Flames? I uh, I I I just have a hard time because I feel like okay, uh, like let's peel back Daryl Sutter. Daryl Sutter, I feel like he should have given Walker Dewar um, a bit of a, a bump and promotion within that one game that he scored, right? And he's been playing very, very well, Walker Dura has. And he's been playing better than uh, Milan Lucic. He, he's had a lot more energy. Uh, he's been uh, uh, involved with the game. In the, and uh, as Glenn Gullickson says, uh, in the fabric of the game more. And I appreciate that of what this player, he, he's made the most opportunity is what, it, what he's had, what he has been given. So 
the the fact that you have a, a coach that isn't really giving the time of day to these type of players so I, as far as like you know the media uh goes i feel like daryl sutter has a short leash but then you look at it and you have brad tree living who's been here for like i said eight years and he what, what has he done right he's put the best players on the ice that he could that he could have and he's if you really break down every single year yeah you know he's he's had his blunders but overall i think think he's done a great job earlier too he hasn't been able to bring in the right coaches like i think he's done what he could with the handcuffs he's been given exactly yeah and like to to go back to your question dan yeah if it was me i would get rid of daryl sutter Mm -hmm. and that that's that's not that 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 has to break down the fact that he's not giving the opportunity to the young players within this lineup and and you know, I, I think Walker Deere deserves better than the fourth line right now. And that, that's not someone who's been talked about, I think, enough within and this Kevin, lineup within the past I, I agree, what, Devin. Month, two months. And Kevin, going back to what you were saying about Daryl maybe getting reprimanded, if you look that week, a whole bunch of the media availabilities and stuff were Kirk Muller. So the Flames may have even put him in timeout for a bit. Yeah. After that happened, they had a lot of availabilities with assistant coaches and that sort of thing. So I kind of wondered, huh, did Daryl get you know, locked in the barn for a week or something like that. Yeah. I, I, I don't. And this is to me, I wonder like, is you like, honestly, Brad has in a lot of ways, Brad has navigated the flames through some really difficult situations. Like you just like, look back at the history in terms of, you could argue is on ice success. I think that there's a, some argument there. But he navigated this team through the Bill Peters situation. He navigated this team through the pandemic. Matthew Gachuk being immature. Yep. He was right behind him when he was doing his first press conference of uh, of his disciplinary actions. Yep. He pulled off. He 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 did what no other GM. He he pulled off. Like he got a massive amount for something that a lot of people didn't see happen. Um. He's been very cordial to the media, and I do think that that plays very well. Um, I think he's very articulate in front of that. Um, I, I, you know, I think that there's a part of me that keeps saying that the ownership loves Daryl Sutter, but I think there's another part of me that realizes that the benefit for this organization going forward is Brad Tree Living, and for the and I would suggest for the younger fan, um, and I don't know, I think the younger, some of the younger fan is turned off by Daryl Sutter's comments and even, you know what, Matthew Coronado, um, and any other future player there, Dustin Wolf, Jerome Poirier, who's going to be a project that I think the flames are going to have to look at one way or the other. There's, I, I it's hard for me to sit here and say that Daryl Sutter is the future with all these contracts we talked about earlier, I think the Flames have a three-year window to win, and I'm not sure right now Daryl's the coach to get them that win in that three years. Keep him around. Keep him on somehow so he gets his cup, which is what he came back for, but bring in a different head coach. But the other side of me also wonders if this this stubborn old the stu- the stubborn old person says, You're okay, darn you darn kids, know- get off my bench. Well, maybe part of it is like he sees what Jacob Pelche and Walker do. Or, and there, there's with, from the player side, which is the other side that we talked about last night, this player group has to hold themselves in some sort of account as well. And let's be fair, there's f- at least four players, five, that I think are going through a significant adjustment this year. Lindholm with, with two new line mates, Kadri, Huberto, Uyghur, new new contracts, new team, new situation. And Jacob Markstrom dealing with the Edmonton Oilers series. Oh, and now I think he's, I think he is still dealing with uh, some PTSD with that. Um, And I think Daryl has to look at everything and say, and I think the players, I think this, this organization needs to come together and say, what is the best way to win? They're not in a situation. They're not in a playoff situation right now. This is not acceptable for anyone in the organization. Um, and I think they got it. I think that this team needs to, will have, I'm, I'm having faith that they come to have the come to Jesus moment. And I think we see more Pelche. I think we see more Walker Dewar. 
And I think we see less Milan Lucic. Do we see more Daniel Vladar? I think he starts the road trip. I think that's really the question of Daryl's turn the corner or not, is how much we see Vladar. The, 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 the numbers do not deny the fact that Vladar has been the better goalie, whether or not he's getting run support or not. I, I have a hard time with that narrative um, that's been out there for the past, what, two weeks, that uh, Markstrom has not had the proper run support. Markstrom needs to make the saves that are able to transition the Flames to get those goals. The amount of times that I've, I've, I've seen uh, a, a really well done uh, penalty kill that goes back the other way, whether or not it's five on five on four and five on three. Um, and within the next minute and a half after that penalty kill has been, uh, or, or that the penalty has been killed off, that there's been a goal on the other, uh, the other team is, is ridiculous. So, uh, having making those saves at those opportune times really does make the difference within the the trust, uh, whether or not it is uh, consciously or subconsciously, uh, within that the, the Flames organization is 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 huge. So run Vladar as far as you can, and hopefully, uh, when you, if he comes back down to earth that you have a Markstrom ready to go and willing and able to, to, to get that confidence back. But Vladar has been statistically and it, it's just so blatantly obvi- obvious that he needs to be starting games. We've seen well, Vladar I, in three I, of the I, last I, four. So I think he is getting the starts. Well, I, what I would say is the numbers are triggering that Markstrom's not getting the run support. So if you're going on this on pure analyticals, I think that there's some argument there. But I also, my eyes are telling me that the Flames are p- playing at a better pace when Vladar is in net than Markstrom is in net. Their Flames are playing tight when Markstrom is in net. They're not off to good starts. They're not handling the puck the same. They're not engaged the same way. I it think feels- part of that is because Markstrom has has let get goals in early. Yep. Uh, the Markstrom we're seeing this year reminds me a lot of um, Markstrom from three, four years ago, um, when that was that was the the book on him. He would be fantastic for most of the game, but he would give up oppor- give up give up inopportune goals at bad like goals at bad times, whether it was early in the game, late in the period, um, or just bad goals, a bad goal here and there. It just it, it it sucks the life out of the players, and then you get you end up chasing the game, which I think is part of what's happened here. And I, while I agree that I think yeah he probably hasn't had the run support, I do think that his his, his ability to make the save at the right time isn't there this season, which is Agreed. huge, and that never shows up in stats, especially in playoffs though, right? Well, the inner the inopportune in, uh, in op- Oh, okay, God. Opportunity. 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 In opportunity. Thank you. Time. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah the, that, that goal is huge within the one beer's trying to kick in, Devin. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, like that can be a game changer and a, uh, a series changer within the playoffs. So it, and it was a series it, changer against the Oilers. Sorry to exactly. interrupt, but it was. It was a complete series changer. Yeah. So go, especially since you're out of the playoffs right now and the the, the games played isn't really in your favor within the, uh, the teams that are in the playoffs or in the wild card in your division. It, 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 you can fucking run with it. You're here to get W's, as he has put before. So run, run with the guy who's doing, uh, who's playing well right now. And I brought this up before. You have... Markstrom, who is a phenomenal goaltender. You had Fleury, who was a phenomenal goaltender. And then you have an up-and-comer of Matt Murray. And you have an up-and-comer of Daniel Vladar, as Carl is just yelling in the background. I'm sorry if you're hearing that. But he's well, obviously pissed as well. I think Carl's agreeing, I think so. I think so. Um, but he, like, the... the it. it is Car- I, yes. I, I don't watch show enough, obviously. Is Carl the Oilers fan? You have hostage in the other room? or. <laughs> He, he's a fat orange cat. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it's it's one of those things where you, 
yeah, go with your gut. Yes, you, I agree. You, you, you have you have uh, um, and Stanley I think Cups you also within your back pocket. What Vladar but... is? Is Vladar a starter? Is he a one B? Is he just a backup with a good year? You're paying it's... the guy two and a half million next year. You got to know what you got. It's really hard to tell though because he he. Having that mentality of being a backup is mm-hmm. different than being. But that's why I think Daryl's got to let him run with it for a bit. Totally, and even even if he runs with it within this year, mm-hmm. I feel like that, that that mentality of being like, "Oh, I'm an underdog." Yeah, let's fucking go. I think and if you run with it this expect- year, you go into camp next year and say, "Guys, no one ha- or, or owns this net. Compete totally. for it." Absolutely, and who knows? Dustin Wolf could be uh, could be pushing for that job too, right? And it, it's good to have competition. It yeah, is and really that's why I think you've got to let them do it because you got to see what you've got there and where does Wolf fit into that pipeline. And that's what I also think has been missing with the Flames this year has been the lack of competition. And that's why I think we're seeing duds this year again in Chicago, in Columbus, and some of these get easy wins is because there's no competition. I think there's a lot of comfortable players on this roster. And that's why I think you have to be playing a Walker Dewar and a Jacob Pelche a lot more. Um, I know that everybody is enamored with Anjuman Japani, and I think that there's a very valid point that Backlund, Coleman, and Majapani have been the Flames' best line this year. But I'm sorry, I don't think Anjuman Japani has been nearly good enough. I think the Flames overvalued some of their assets. I think they overvalued what they have in Manjapani. I think for years they've overvalued what they have in Dubé, and I think yep. they expected more from both those guys with their top two leaving and weren't able to get it. Yeah, but what like with Manjapani, you you quote unquote underrated him for how many years? How many one year contracts has he done? How many years has he uh, really been okay? He's he's outplayed what he's presented towards upper management, right? And this is the one year that we're like, okay, we'll give you a three year deal. But I think that they probably looked at him signing that five point eight million deal and saying he can take some of the load off Johnny or Matthew. And I don't know that he's able to take that step. I think he was sort of at his peak where he was going to be before that. And I've always thought that Dubé was a third liner. Well, and it's, yeah, you, you, I, I think Dubé's he is out. <laughs> he shouldn't be on that first line. No, I don't like there's there's no way. But once again, who the fuck are you going to put in there? Well, I think that was Manjapani's spot, but he never achieved that. I think did, did he get the chance to do that, though? That's the other thing both. is that we sorry, Sean, go for it. I say both of them are, are just good middle six wingers. Mm-hmm. Um, Manjapani came off of a career year, got paid. Dubé has got another year after this year left on his deal. That was a show um, me deal. See what, yeah, and see what happens there. He's got he's had a decent season, twenty seven points in fifty games. But that's a sixteen million dollar third line. That's expensive. Yeah, but it's and that but that's the issue with the Flames right now is just they've got they just they don't they haven't had as you guys are talking about they haven't had the guys that they wanted to step up step up, and they need that to happen within this year or next year. Yep. Dan, you talked about how you think that they've got a three year window. I think it's two. I think it's this year and next year because after next season, you've got Backlund off the books, Lindholm off the books, oh. Toffoli off the books, Noah Hannafin off the books, Zadorov off the books. Like you, you do have a lot. Like, no, I, a lot I of think cap coming yeah. coming off, but there's a like Hannafin and and Lindholm specifically are going to want a lot of. Uh, and then that's even more reason to maybe contracts. sacrifice this year, if you will, and say, let's try Pelty, let's try Dewar, let's try, you know, Zari, let's see what we've got for next year. Absolutely. Let alone, let, yeah, and let alone Dubé will need a new new contract at that point. Uh, Ruzichka will need a new contract at that point. The, those are going to be cheap deals. Uh, most like, maybe. Um, Tanev's off the book. Tan, you, you, Tanev's a done contract's done in two seasons as well. So it's you're going to have a much right. different looking team after after the next season, and that's I think also part of, part of the reason I'm so disappointed with the team this year because they're squandering their prime years. Yeah. So then, what, what think, do you guys expect? What's going to happen at this trade deadline? I, I think, think they go. I think they swing for the fences. I don't. I I think Brad has always said you you need to tell me you you'll tell me on the ice what you want me to do. That's always been his philosophy. 
and they haven't told him they've told him not to swing for the fences that's well, uh, when i say swing for the fences i don't think they go for a rental i think they're going for within with someone who's under contract for this year and next i don't think they can at least. they don't have any contract they, room they after don't. all these extensions i think they got to get money off the books not on the books well they've got Lucci's coming off the books that after this season that's which is huberto Hebrews, my yeah, and then you got to find money for Uyghur. You got to find money for Vladar. Those are big extensions. You've got to find, yeah. by my count, about eighteen million. Not quite. Let's call it. What, uh, like, what, which, nine, which is nine. which is so hard because this is the window. This is yeah. this is where this organization is at, and it and that's even more reason to bring up cheap guys like Peltier. Exactly. Let, let them fucking run. Let yeah. them go within this uh, top nine, especially hey, back, with Backlund. Yeah, Backlund's was... having a. He he literally said right before he left for his uh, his little vacation here that he's played his best first half of the year that he's ever played, which I agree with. He's mm-hmm. been amazing, but that's your once again that's your third fucking line. Coleman, he has been as advertised within this year. He's not been amazing. He's not been terrible. And like Dan said, uh, manjipani has been okay. I thought so Coleman let, looked the best he's looked as a flame. Agreed for sure, but he's not as he he hasn't looked as good as he was down in Tampa. No, and yes, that's two and a half years removed, or I guess two years removed, uh, or a year and a half, I guess. Um, but it, it it's still it's it's not good enough. Is this team good enough? The whole thing about talking about the Islanders before. There are at least one and a half players short of a top six. We are one and a half, like the Calgary Flames are one and a half players um, away from a top nine. And what we're talking about a a Pacific division, which was very gettable at the beginning of the year. You had LA playing out of their mind. You have Seattle playing out of their mind. Are they going to be able to come back down to earth in time for the Flames to get in? I don't fucking know. I have no I idea. There's a, I think there's Islanders a lot of parallels between the Islanders and the Flames. Yeah, they're, I agree they're, for sure. Um, what I hear, I, I think this is go just to go back with one of the frustrations with the handling of the young players is last year there was found money. We had Oliver Shillington found money. Adam Ruzicka found money. The Flames had the opportunity for found money and Jacob Pelche to put him in earlier. And even in training camp, let's take this all the way back. You had an opportunity to possibly just experiment with the fact of throwing Kadri and Pelche together in an exhibition game. Let's try it out. What the hell? It's not for wins and losses. Let's see what happens. And you maybe you would have been able to find that cheap top six option and, and found that instead of trying to have to go out and spend assets and something that you don't really have to go find it. That's that's that found money. And they <laughs> and Sutter Sutter, I'm sorry. The thing that bothers me is how Sutter handled the lineup after that that Oilers game in October, where yeah, they lost, but to drastically change the lineup the way that he did and be stubborn about it up to this point, it probably is what's going to cost the flames in the long run. How upset are we with the fact that it feels like Daryl Sutter is bigger than the team? Right? And that, that that that's the way that it feels. Last year, I was okay with that. Like, last year, I thought Daryl was the captain of this team. And I was okay Agreed. with with that. And I think now it's, yeah, it's a bad thing now. And like it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what he says behind the doors. It's how he's presented within the front of this media, right? But to, to uh, we, we've been down this road. To, to, to Kevin's point, you had how many players having career years, found money. It was a and lot. Yeah, and now all of a sudden, you, you know, you didn't give the the opportunity for that organically to kind of develop. And I think that this is what ended up hurting. And you put like, like, Lucic with Kadri. Like, no wonder why Hubert. Like, it just it didn't. The lineup didn't work. It was whether or not he, uh, he like Daryl Sutter was, uh, you know, being very uh, like favoritive towards Lucic, considering this was his last year. Considering Kev, you brought this up um, either this last podcast, the podcast before, of whether or not you, you know he how fragile is Milan Lucic. 
And it's like, okay, are you are you for the veteran players on this team? Are you for or, or are you for the the this, the success of this franchise? And that that's the biggest thing that has been the question mark. I don't think it has to be one of the, the Calgary other. Flames. Well, it, it kind of does though, doesn't it? In Daryl's world, it does. But I think you can put both those guys in the lineup. You put Lucic on the fourth yes. line. But yeah. but like okay, so you you have. Uh, Walker Dewar, who is better than Lucic. Do we not agree with that? Yeah, but I think Lucic could be your 13th forward and still be a key contributor to this team. Well, what What's... about his uh, uh, Daryl Sutter's right-hand man and uh, Brett Ritchie? You know? He, he's you he's a good 13th. Trevor Lewis. But, yeah, exactly. And like, the, okay. I, I, would I, I love keep, Trevor I, Lewis. I think he's really fourth, fourth exactly liner number what... six. They're all interchangeable. <laughs> yeah. But Trevor, well, no, hold on, no. Trevor Lewis... I think has done exactly what what has been needed, and I, I I don't think he's been part of the problem with the Flames Agreed. this year. Agreed. And like and like Lucic being on that second line, he was being the best Lucic he could be at this point in, in his career, but he was not put in the uh, the right role to succeed. So that that's the biggest question mark within this uh, this organization is, okay, does uh, Daryl Sutter have autonomy over uh the gm brad tree living i don't think so but that that like having even having that thought process is fucked well and devin this. i i asked kevin the question last night does it come down to the fact where we say we need a gm that's going to play with daryl or we need a coach that's going to play with the gm like we need to is it going to kind of be one or the other a, we need a different if if everything is true within the media and how we feel as fans then we need a new coach. I'm sorry. We need a new coach. Then it comes down to ownership, whether or not they're willing to let go of this coach, even after he just had a two-year extension after this year. And even though they don't want to get rid of him, I think there's a way you can get him to retire and not pay him out. But will he? But that, I mean, we're talking about a guy who has a mass, who potentially has a massive ego on him. And who just won the fucking Jack Adams last year? It's so it like it, but wars don't mean anything. Only wins do. My my whole thing is that there's so many question marks outside of this roster. No, I that agree. is 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 hindering the the process of this team and making sure that you have uh, the 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 kids of this organization being able to thrive pro- uh, properly and. You're you you're you're looking at a a winning window, quote unquote, within the next. I, I I'm I'm kind of with Sean. It's it's it doesn't feel like three years. It feels like two years. So maybe the better way to phrase this then is: Is this season salvageable, or do we just play the young guys and get what we get? The answer is yes. You play the young guys, and because they're they're, they're it's it's not about like they're 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 not as bad as saying the young guys. They no, are but- better than the average uh, fourth liner on this team for sure. But let's say those guys falter a little bit, which they will at some point rookies do. Do you still keep sure. playing them through that? Or do you say we're here to win? We got to take you out or demote you. Or do you say we're putting the young guys in and we get what we get out of them? Well, he, he, I think you have a better chance of winning and putting the young guys in than having Lucci's on that fucking second line. I don't disagree. I think you got to play your best lineup, Dan. And, and the best lineup to me is, is li- right now forward wise, Lindholm, Dubé, Toffoli, the uh, Kadri, Pe- Hubert, Opelche, yeah, Backlund, and Colby, Majapani, and if Pelche, Lewis du- Dewar, and Ruzicka, some that co- kind of combination. That's the four. That's the the twelve forwards I would go with. And if Pelche decide or isn't able to stand up to that, Walker Dewar is very formidable to be on that second line. I, I just I, don't I, think he's the goal scorer that Pelche is no. potentially. Be. No, 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 no. You're talking about a role player within that role, w- within that second line. I, I forget who has been the um, color commentator uh, other than Kelly Rudy. Greg Millen. Greg Millen has been talking about Walker Dewar as a Zach Hyman type of player, and I can see it. I can see that very sim- uh, very similar type of player and being like, okay, let, let's get dirty. Let's get in the corners. Let me pass it out to... Um, Huberto and Huberto has a really good shot as well. Who, which you know, they, they, I think that he needs to utilize a little bit more. Um, but you, you have those role players on those lines for a reason, and 
I think that he would be a very formidable second liner, better than Lucic, and I better than better Coleman, than Lucic, but I don't, and better I don't than Manjipan. I don't think Walker Duer has the same upside as a Hyman. No, I, 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 well, I don't think that, he doesn't have the same offensive upside no. as a Hyman. But, but he I has the think, same work ethic and yeah, better work ethic than and speed than I uh, a Lucic, would, which is my point. Yeah, the Flames play with a be- absolutely are playing with a much better pace with a Pelche and a Doer in the lineup than they do do with a Lucic. Like, I I think that that to me, um, I'm not I don't always go by the analytics on this, but my eye test is telling me that quicker pace, sure. quicker to the puck, quicker quicker to the boards. Quicker. So again, Devin, let's say we go with what you said and we try Doer on the second line, and it's not quite gelling. I, I think again, go back to my point. Do we keep? To sort of trying it, or do we say, well, we're we're running for the playoffs. We got to demote him because it's not quite going the way we want. Well, who who are you putting there then? Is my question. Well, I think hey, you can run Luke- the top six of Dubé, Lindholm, Toffoli, Peltier, Kadri, Huberdo, and be good enough. I, I would agree with you, but if you are looking for a shakeup, Dewar is the next man up within that thought process, and depending on what, whether or not Manjipani is playing to that that same caliber, mm-hmm. you have three Rizicha. guys within there. Rizicka, he's too he's too up and down. His his ups are really good, but he tends to lose himself. That's why he got uh uh that's why he's a a, a sec a fourth round draft pick is because he wasn't able to have that consistency. He has but that I still upside. Think I, I would I him. still think I would make sure that, that would be an option as well. You've got Trevor Lewis who can center your fourth line. You definitely could run run that risk. It's just, uh, it's not even a risk. It's a, it's like okay, that that's a fourth man up essentially out of those top three that I just listed. See, I would I would have Rizicka just because he, I and I think Daryl would have would have Rizicka over over Dewar at the point at this point for that spot on the second line if Pelche doesn't doesn't work out. I, I'd say that's a crying shame if that's the case. And, well, and the, the, the question is, where does the Horna fit in here? I, and he's, he's, another fourth liner, but he's also someone who's quicker than most of the other fourth liners that they have up, out uh, on there other than Dewar. But then and we're does, talking about uh, Daryl Sutter being very veteran forward. Like the, the, I, I think I, I love this conversation, but is this ever going to come down to what we're thinking? Well, let me throw another wrench into this conversation. And this is something that Dan and I debated last night. And I, uh, by the way, we've we've come to the same we we haven't come to the same conclusions on this, but the Calgary Wranglers are in a Calder Cup position, contending position. At what point do you say? And I I, I'm just curious. What point do you say? Okay, maybe it might be valuable for a Jacob Pelche and Walker Dewar to go on a Calder Cup run and not be on this organ in this organization. And see how far they get with the Calder in a playoff run, and and say and go. Okay, let's see where we where the Wranglers go and gain that gain playoff experience. Well, although it's not Stanley Cup experience, what does that play into this at some point? The Calgary Flames have to be out of the running for the playoffs. I'm with yeah. you on that. That's my answer. That's and, where like, I'd be at too. If they were if they, if they were in where the Canucks are, are right now with. And they, they, I would agree that they should be doing what the Canucks are doing with Pod Coles and Hoaglander and now uh, Turatu, where they're going to marinate them in the AHL. Right now, when they're in the the experience that Peltier could and Dewar could be getting at the NHL level, where we're playing meaningful games, trying to get the, into the playoffs or as high into the playoffs as possible, that's more valuable than... Then, but are you robbing Peter sort of... to pay Paul? If you take all the best guys off the HL roster, are you then depriving other prospects who aren't those five we named of having that playoff experience? It's not. It's not a like a hot. It, like it's not a very definitive being like okay, we're out of the playoffs. Let's go. Like the 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 the, the chances that we're going to be the chances that we're going to be the, the Flames are going to be within a playoff run is very much within the realm of going into game eighty two. That that's the reality of it, right? But if you if you depending on who's in front of you, there's, there's a lot of what my, my point is that there's, there's a lot of variables within this conversation of making sure that yes, you want to make sure that your the young players have that experience of doing a playoff run, 
And what, when does that playoff run start? Is it after the, the 82 game season? Yeah. Like yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's why I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying you could send Pelche and do when the flames are out of the playoffs, if they're out of the playoffs, you can send Pelche and Dewar down and they can do the same thing. Like you've done now, right? You've sent Pelche, you've sent Dewar down. They're playing games in, at, uh, in well, he had two the, points in his first game back down. Yeah. And Daryl was there. So, you know, and then you bring, I just think you bring them up and I think it just thinks it brings a different energy to this team. It just, this team doesn't have, this team is lacking a lot of emotion and energy and just like it just, it just is. And I think Pelche and Dewar add that in, in like just to me in terms of going through the trade deadline. It's not only the asset part that concerns me. It's just you're bringing in another guy to this roster that's already been through all of these adjustments. Like, let this team kind of gel. And the the whole thing within that as well is like, yeah, I I said this before Pelche got in uh, to to the lineup is that they they lacked the 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 desire and the, the, the love of the game again. And I, I've, I just have really have a hard time thinking about, okay, you bring in a uh, Van Riemsdyk, you bring in a uh, Domi, and it, is, is that going to make or break the Calgary Flames? Yes, it brings you depth. I just, I, I, unless and things Devin change, the- unless things yeah. change within this trajectory of um, after the, the, the All Star break. That doesn't they make much sense to me. No. And I no. think if we look at this and we say, you know what, this team's got two or three years, do we really want to be mortgaging draft picks? I think right now, no. making those picks, which is what it's going to take to make any big deal, either picks or prospects, are something the Flames need. Because I think they're about to go through a cycle where they need as many young assets as they can get. And, yeah. they, I mean, right now they're projecting just under $3 million of cap space going into next year, which yeah. isn't ideal. Um, and yes, we've had some good years of picking well in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, but you've got to start getting first and second round picks again. Yep. Yep. And making them hit. If the, if you don't, then you're <laughs> uh, the, the next decade of the Calgary flames is going to be goddamn shitty to watch. Yep. And we've seen teams have gone all in every year and had no picks. And those teams have struggled for a long time to rebuild what's in the cupboards. And to me, if we think Peltier is ready, I always say, who's next up then? Like, you've got to have that development cycle constantly churning. So Peltier is on the NHL team. Who's behind him? And the other thing is, if you're not within that first three uh, team teams in, in your division – what the fuck are you doing? I'm sorry. Yeah. You're, 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 you have the lottery, you have the lottery balls in the outset of it. And then you have the lottery balls uh, right before the, uh, the trade deadline, mm-hmm. <laughs> which would you rather pick the long view or the short term? I agree. Well, the one thing that I will say, I think this year, I mean, every year there's upsets. So I mean, I'm not saying the flames can just get in and things can happen, but you know, um, I I also don't like. It really depends on who finishes first in this specific division. I, I I think that there's a there's an upset in the waiting there for sure. But absolutely, it, the, the consistency is not there with the Flames though, and that's what's concerning. That's, that, yeah, it, that's Each my worry. Game is well. a goddamn yeah. crapshoot. And, and we who, saw that in the Edmonton series, right? You never knew which Flames team you're going to get. Yeah, shift to shift. Absolutely, right? and yep. the, that that is the detriment of the Calgary Flames is you, you don't you have no idea what the hell you're going to get night in night out. Yeah, whether are, are you going to get good goaltending from uh, from Markstrom? Are you going to get the run sport for Markstrom? Is Bladar going to be staying on his head? How good is that uh, top four D? How good is that top six uh, forwards? I I, I just I, I if I was betting. I would not bet the Flames to be successful within the playoffs, and that sucks. Yeah, and you you, you touched on something there, Dev. Like we do, we've talked a lot about the forwards. I I have not like I I think the the mix on the blue line's not right as well. I, I think it's the best it can be without Shillington. 
But do, the, the other question is, do we know what Shillington is? He had one year of greatness, and that's beside arguably the best defenseman on the Flames. But I think even if he's playing on your 5-6, this, this defense is a lot better than with Stone every night or Gilbert every night. Agreed, but is that going to an, uh, is that going to amount to more wins? Maybe, maybe, maybe it'll uh, well, within that three on three. Um, considering what is it nine overtime losses that the Calgary Flames have had, maybe that'll even out to six overtime losses and three more wins. I, it's, but either, either way, even if you, you put those three wins on uh, on the Flames' year, they, they're still not a, a playoff team. But, I mean, we talked about how, you know, we don't know if they're playing well in front of Marsham, and I wonder if, you know, more solid defense might fix some of those issues too. Like, I wonder if it's a little bit of a dominoes effect. But is Shillington really good in that defensive zone? Woo! <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> We've seen a lot of growth in him, though. I mean, remember there was a time when we didn't think Shillington would be back, and then he had a great season. Like, I'm I'm wondering if there's a next step there or not. Well, we – even fair. if he's – like, I, I – let, let's – I mean, there's a time he was worse than Connor Mackey, and we all thought he wouldn't be back. He, but, okay, let's let, – I'm not – like, with all due respect to Oliver Shillington, I don't know what's going on. I have no inside information. I just don't think it's reasonable to expect him to come back. Not this year. And even no. if he comes back next year, what's he going to look like after not being in the league for a year? Yeah, exactly. And I'm, you know, I'm sure he's skating, but like, well, he's look, skating, Connor... but you know, he's not skating with a top tier team over there. And even skating is different than yeah. you know he... being a game speed. He's yeah. practicing with the third tier team over there, a third tier yeah. team. And now the, yeah. the other, the other, the other big question mark now, unfortunately, is the health of Chris Tanov and where he's at and. I think if I if the the, the Flames are going to be making a, a big splash, I don't think it's up front. It has to be a defense, and I I For sure. I, I and you know what? And I'll just stand, you know let's pat ourselves on the back. While all four, there was a bunch of Flame fans out there who were saying that this defense was elite. We did not say that. We didn't say that. We said this team this defense was solid, not elite, and we're we're seeing it right now. Like, but. Sorry, Kev, go for it. Anderson and Hannafin have taken steps, steps, but I don't think Hannafin has been consistent. I don't think either of them have been truly consistent. I think Anderson is making you know, huge strides, but I think, you know, still some work. I think still a little bit of work is needed in both of them. Um, I and Tanov, God love him, and he came back. And I, I you know what? I'm a Tanovologist, but I, I just, it's, a tanovologist. I I am a really hard pressed. Is that to... like a fancy name for a stalker? It's it's <laughs> my belief. You're, you were the a... one, you're the one talking about peering at Lindholm through a. That makes yeah. me a Lindholmologist. <laughs> yeah. But I just it's. Well, I, and I start wondering if Tan if Tanev's on the downswing. Like he got hurt last year. For all we know, he's hurt this year. I think we've seen the best years of Chris Tanev. Unfortunately, I think he's, I think he's only think... thirty-three. Come on, come on. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think that the miles are starting to catch up yep. to him, and if and that's why I think it's it's not if you move him down to a bottom six role or like the the the, the third pair, and you can find another top four that makes the 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 uh, the blue line a lot better. But and I would rather shop that, for that guy in the off season than the deadline. When you when you when you do that, it's also good. You can you can also make it a left shot guy, so that's going to be less less expensive because you can yeah. just move Weger back to his 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 natural side. But I think it's I don't I think that's if they're going to swing for the fences. I think that's what they're going to do. It'll be for a top four defenseman. Not for a forward, even though I do, Debbie, you did talk, say that you think they're like a, a player, player and a half away from a, a good top nine. But I, that's all on Pelche to, to, to see if he can fill that role. I agree, Sean. I think you've got the guys internally that might be able to do that. If they're going to get a top four defenseman, it has to be a veteran that it ha- brings some stability within that, uh, that back end there because uh, y- y- you have. 
Hannafin, who's 26. You have Anderson, who's 26. You have Zadorov, who's 27. Uh, Mackenzie Weger, yes, he's 29, but he, he he doesn't have that stability. He doesn't have – how many times within a game does he throw a pizza uh, up the middle or – uh, the, the, the amount of giveaways that uh, that defenseman has, you need to make sure that you're surrounding that top four with a solid defenseman. And I don't know if that's out there within this trade market. So I'm with Dan with that. You, you, you got you should trade for him in the off season. And I'm not saying this is a this is a wash of a uh, of of a season with whether you trade for him or go shopping right for him. I just think there's more options in the off season. Oh, always are for sure. I, you can get by with that top nine that you have right now and really hope that, that at least two players within each line is able to, to thrive and, and carry that line. But if, if that's not the case, God, I'm, I'm very, I don't know if you guys have, uh, have uh, really sensed my tone, within this podcast. I'm very skeptical of the flames and, and their, their, their ability to get yep. past the first round, let alone get in the fucking well, playoffs. And, but Devin, I think that's being logical and realistic. I mean, as flames fans, when was the last time we saw them go past, you know, round two, it feels like Oh four, man. <laughs> it really does. You know, it has been Oh four. And even it, talk, has it been Oh four? Yeah, it has. It's been Oh four. Uh, yeah. And even talking about that defenseman they need, to me, it's another reason to keep your first round pick. Like, let's draft and develop internally instead of going and buying an expensive option. Yeah, that is good. I'm I'm looking at sort of left shot, sort of steadying defensemen. Don't say the 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 rental market, Shane Gosses be here, doesn't fit that role. Eric Gustafson does not fit that role. Dmitry Orlov. Maybe, yeah. Right. Washington's, well, Washington's, Washington's still in that race, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Oli Mata. No. Mm-hmm. Ian Cole Tam- on Tampa. Brian Dumoulin on Pittsburgh. Dmitry Kulikov on Anaheim. He's a nope, bit nope, too. Nope. nope. Hey. <laughs> Vladislav Gavrikov from Columbus. Maybe. He- Oh, I think I think the price would be too high if you are, high. if if they aren't willing to, and that's why I say maybe. <laughs> um, let's see, but here. I don't want to pay de- like I'm okay with those guys, but I'm not okay with those guys at deadline prices. No, exactly, yes, and that's a point. The, that's the, my issue. The lemon isn't worth the squeeze at that point. Okay, there's well, okay, let me let. There's one other name that's been out there. Um, Jake McCabe's name has come up. That, that price point is too high. He's he's what is he 26, 27. That's yeah, right I, in this prime. There, there's no way that Chicago at a rebuild is not asking for a first and a prospect or a second and a prospect and a B prospect. Like Jake they, McCabe is 29 years old, signed for two more years after this at four million dollars. Like I said, 27. Yeah, let Edmonton have him. <laughs> And I think if, if we say that they're going to bring him a K, my question is then who do you move on in the offseason to afford him? Because as we talked about, they need money. Just under $3 million. I mean, Projected. You, uh, to me, if you're going to bring him to K, you've almost then got to buy out Tanev or something, which they're not going to do. No. Yeah. It, it, I, might, be, it might be a Shillington buyout, potentially, depending on what, what's happening. But at 2.5, that's not going to come not. from a No, well, it's not. It really yeah. is. No. And I mean, it's it's possible that you know, depending on what the situation is, you're if Shillington's not back, they can put him on a they could they can put him on a LTIR or whatever, and then you have that cap room to play with for the trade deadline, and maybe with that you could play with something. But and still. I believe if they really wanted to, if he doesn't come back, they could say that he failed to report and buy him out without the cap hit. Yeah. Yeah, that, but that's I, a business, I business know, side no, of things for I, sure. Dan, I don't think they can do that. No, I think no. I think it. I think they. He would just go on to LTIR. Okay. Yeah. They, and I. I yeah. I and honestly even, think the Flames would, would just want to support him anyway. Whatever is going, I don't know what's going on, but I think that that's the most important thing. And I don't think they would want to buy him out. But if you buy him it, out, you give him a bunch of cash. I mean, he's still making the same money either way. Yeah. It, yeah, but and, you're not you're you're not with a team and though and do you still have the same 
availability for some of the support that is possibly needed in this situation. Yeah, we'd have to see if he still gets the PA support then. Yeah, that's that would be my concern. I no, I don't I, think, I, don't, I don't see yeah, Shillington coming back. I don't think that uh, he will be available for next year for the Calgary Flames. So this will be it's either he'll go in LTIR, I think, and not being able to to physically and mentally be there because I do believe that it is a mental thing that he's going through. Yeah, I I don't know what it is, and but I'm just I don't you know, I, hey, I'm I'm hey, I listen I'm speculating. You can call me out for it, but it, no, everything... no, I, I'm not. I'm not going to call you out. For it. I, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't know what it is. But I, what I'm trying, what I, I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah. What is is it? Whatever it is, yep. it's obvious he needs some sort of support. And for sure. will, yeah, yeah. And, and the only reason, you know, and and if he needs that support and he still wants to play hockey, I think maybe his NHL days are done and he keeps playing back home for a team local to him. And yeah. Um, anything else within the flames? I think we've, uh, we've beaten the, the Blasty to dead. Blasty. Blasty's finally dead. Sweet. Yep. Oh, Blasty's <laughs> alive right here. I don't have to see that Jersey anymore. Just the pedestal then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't mind the pedestal. I love the pedestal. It's grown on me. Just like yeah, you have grew. with me. Uh, <laughs> I'll I'll sit at the pedestal level as long as you tell me I'm not heritage classic level with you. <laughs> no comment. Uh, some th- other things I wanted to talk about here uh, with Devin on, I think it would be a good perspective. John Tavares played his 1,000th game Who? this weekend. John Tavares. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Pajama boy. Oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah. yeah. You've already answered my question. I I I do think in some ways. Uh, he never turned out to be that superstar we were all expecting. And I think, you know, he got that huge contract and all of that. And I, I don't know if he, I don't know if we could say he's lived to that, but I think that that was such an impossible contract to live with. But um, I think it's a significant I think part of that's the market he's in too. Yep. Um, and I, the expectations around that market and all of that, um, I think he's underappreciated for sure. I think he's, I think he turned out to be a damn good player, not the superstar everyone expected, but I don't think he's, you know, he, he had a, he had a Canadian Olympic run uh, on the team. I, you know, I think, I think I appreciate him. Um, I think it will be an interesting question if he's a hall of famer or not, but I, I wouldn't say he's underrated, but I would say he's underappreciated. He is underappreciated within that market. The amount of stability that he brought to that dressing room, I think, is very uh, – it, it should be noted and should be recognized within that that market because it is, it is very <laughs> uh, high-tempered. And, yes, he didn't put up the numbers that he should, and he's doing very, very well for uh, – what, what what he's done in the past in, in according to this year but the 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 amount of leadership that that uh John Tavares has brought to that dressing room into um not not it, I'd say it's more so off the ice that uh the, the amount of respect that he deserves and there's a lot of people who I'm sure would disagree with me within uh, he's worth that contract. No, he's not worth that contract. Every single, the, not every single, but the majority of the free agency contracts are really not worth what that that player uh, is. But that dressing room of Toronto really needed stability, and he came in at the right time to to bring that, especially with everything that was, hap- that was happening with Austin Matthews, um, uh, Mitch Marner. Um, and the 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 lack of a veteran presence uh, and notoriety because of how high Marner and Nylander and uh, Matthews were within that uh, organization, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, he he just needs to be recognized for for that alone. Yes, he has what two years left, 
at $11 million. It's a shit ton of money, but it, yeah, I, I think it, it, it bleeds through that organization more than just on the ice. I agree. And I, I think that's one thing people this... forget about these Canadian markets. These guys do a lot more in their market than just what's on the ice. We see that here yeah. in Calgary. It's true in Toronto. Vancouver as well. Yep. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I look, I look at, I look, I'm looking at his, his stats here because he, he's got one 40 goal season, uh, four 30 goal seasons. He's only sco- he scored 20 in every other season except for the Great White North season. We're at 19. Um, so he's got 412 goals, 946 points. He's going to get to 1,000 points. If he can get to 500 goals, I think. Because when you look at that, was he... It doesn't scream Hall of Fame career, but then when you add up the totality... And you look at who else is in there. And the fact he's playing in Toronto, I think, is going to help his yeah. folks. Exactly, yep. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to bring up. I just, I think he, he could, especially especially if he hits those milestones. If he hits 500 goals, if he hits 1,000 points. You, you got to expect that he's going to have at least one more contract outside of uh, this existing one, whether or not it's going to be in a... Fuck! It could be Arizona for God's sakes. I, I, I hope he doesn't. Right but he, he like it, he's just such a leader, right? And that you're gonna have those organizations that are gonna be looking for those type of quote unquote value deals. But a leader within the dressing room. I've heard him compare. I've heard him compared a lot to Giordano in that way. That his what he does is measured off the ice more than on the ice. Totally. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it'll be up to what what he wants to do because after uh, he'll be he'll be thirty four, uh, yeah, he'll be he'll be turning thirty five to start the twenty five twenty six season. Will be when he'll be looking for a new deal. Is he is that is that the end of John Tavares or is that or will he be looking for one more go? I think a lot of it'll depend on whether or not uh, the success that the the Leafs have in the next two and a half years if they're able to 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 win a cup i wouldn't be surprised to see him ride off into the sunset if they don't i think he might try and go somewhere where he thinks he could do i agree i think he might do the jerome and try to chase the cup for a couple years yeah 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 could see that uh there was this con- there, uh, in terms of there was a controversy in Vancouver, uh, shockingly, on Friday when Ilya Mikheyev was announced that he he played the game, and then they announced that they were shutting him down for the rest of the year. Calgary, we have the Chris Tanev situation where he's played hurt. In Montreal, you had the Cole Caulfield situation where um, there's been was some question of how his injury was handled. Um, I just, first of all, want to congratulate all of you on Twitter that got your medical degree over the pandemic. I am so impressed that you took the time to get that medical degree and know what every doctor is amazing. Wow. It's amazing how much you all know about. Kevin, you didn't know there's this Twitter account. You tweet to it and they send you a medical degree. Oh, is it? It's like Dr. Nick. That's right. Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. But um, Dr. Nick and Dr. Phil Institute of Online Medicine, sponsored by Donald Trump. (laughs) What the hell did I miss? Everything. (laughs) Oh, we're we're actually going to be talking about something very good, very appropriate for you, Dev. Torn ACLs. (laughs) So, yeah, McKayev, McKayev has played the year with a torn, with an injury. And they shut it down. It's, on... Is it still kind of partially there, or is it completely yeah. torn? It was, par- it was a partial tear. Partial. A little bitch. <laughs> I have no ACL. Damn it! I don't either. <laughs> yeah, you will know, get back on the ice. Damn it! <laughs> but I, you know, I just 
I guess it's the player's choice whether they can play through this pain or not. And, you know, high elite athletes, they do this. And I, I guess ultimately my, you know, there was a lot of criticism towards the medical community. I think that that's one sort of where my joke is coming from. Um, but it's ultimately, I guess, the player's decision whether they can play or not, right? And, you know, Ilya went on Twitter and explained his situation, that it was something that he felt he could play through. And in the end, that he couldn't. We saw that last year with Sean Monaghan. He couldn't, at the end, play through it. Um, I guess, ultimately, this is sort of where I'm at. It's the player's decision. I don't, I mean, I think, I don't know if I would encourage the same situation but the player has i think it's the player's decision as much as the team's decision these guys are a business asset for the team and they don't want to let the player go out and hurt themselves right but the bottom line is wins and losses right and yeah that's that's your best marketing ploy right the market your your best promotional tool as much as we have blasties and pedaled souls and all of these sort of jerseys wins and losses are your best marketing tool um, yeah, but you've also got to balance that win now versus that contract over five years or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Just just before we move on, uh, just like how I have the the uh, the Devon bat signal, we uh, we we hit the New York Islander bat signal, New York Islander fan bat signal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> JT, JT is, is a liar, liar, not a leader. Oh, there we go. Okay. Are we talking about Justin Tavares or, or uh, John Tavares, Tavares or Justin Timberlake? What's JT? Yeah. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or Justin Thomas. I don't know. I'm, there you I'm go. Very confused. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, where was I going? Um, <laughs> well, I think with with, with injuries, it, it is a it is a collaboration. Uh, you have to like, and it's. With the Mikheyev injury, it there was more it, more there than just that. You had the Quinn Hughes comments about the Tanner Pearson injury that play into that. Um, Vancouver, the Vancouver market's just angry right now, so they're just fight. They just want to find different ways to be angry at the Canucks. Um, and yeah, but it's if the player wants to play. The medic, there is no medical reason to hold them out. Let them play. And there's no, and they're, you're still playing for something. Cause that's what really pulled the plug on both Mikheyev and, and Caulfield was that they, they wanted to get these procedures done so that they can be ready for next season. As opposed to if it, they were still in the playoff hunt, still playing meaningful games, they'd still be playing. Yeah, and that's kind of and what I was saying about balancing the play versus the long term. Yeah. So it's it's yeah, I think it's it's very tough. It's why I stay out of it most. I try and stay out of that type of arguments and, and discussions, other than to say like it's it's a yeah. it's a complicated issue that you can't you don't if you you don't have the information you can't you can't really make an, a a a proper. Like, their body, their choice. The NHL is the best doctors in the world to either clear them or not clear them. Yeah. And that's uh, where I'm getting my ACL repaired from, is from the best doctors in the goddamn world. Dr. Nick? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Dr. French. Close enough. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So no, you, you, uh, are, you are right. It's It's... It, the, the whole debate of Buffalo and Jack Eichel last year, I was more so siding with Jack Eichel because it's his body. You know, it, it, it's the way that he wants to go forward. And I know that's not where we're really talking about the the morality of whether or not um, you have a contract with the team or not. But it's it's you know you, you got to do what's best for your your, your own your own personal growth and if it uh, aligns with the organization you're in with, that's just a, I believe it's called double jeopardy. And I've never read an NHL contract, but I'd be curious what the language is in there around the team making those decisions versus the player. Uh, and that was part of the, the whole Jack Eichel conversation yeah. last year, 
was that and that fight for them to have the procedures that they want to have if even if the um the team doesn't want it team doesn't want that and i've always said this it's just like yeah you can do whatever you want with your body you may have to take some of the the just the, the you might have to assume some of that risk. Uh, depending on what you've just dis- what you yeah. decide to do um and sometimes that is if that's in um not agreeing with with your employer for these guys it's the their their teams there there may be repercussions there but i think it's for the most part i think you're seeing more teams try and work work, work collaboratively with the their medical um professionals yeah. uh the second and third opinions that the players are allowed to get as well as the players and their representatives and i think looking at different types of medicine than they have in the past as well and different yeah. types of procedures and i do yeah i think the the whole thing and devin devin knows this very much so with his acl as well um the in the past few years there's a lot more research into what you can do without yeah. the, the without those those ligaments as opposed to getting them surgically repaired. Especially when you're a high performance podcast like Devin. <laughs> yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, I, you know I, I I haven't had my ACL for the past eight years, <laughs> and it served me decently well. And but that kind of goes it goes hand in hand within my uh, my own business. But uh, yeah, be, 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 there are like in all honesty, there are professional soccer players who have no ACL and MCL, mm-hmm. um, but they are able to continue without surgery. So it, each circumstance and each um, uh, tear is completely different uh, depending on who you talk to and who you believe and who you trust. And going back to our Royal Rumble analogies in the beginning, I mean, look at Stone Cold with his big knee braces, right? I mean, that guy had no knees and he was able to keep doing what he did at a high level. Yeah, what a goddamn beauty he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, even you know, even Kevin Owens, like a lot. There's yeah, a lot of these athletes, a lot of high performance athletes. I mean, football, you know, Patrick Mahomes with his ankle, um, he was able to, you know, he was able to adjust and win the game. And you know, it, it's what was it the per- refs' fault? Uh, it's yeah, there were some refing questions for sure, but Patrick Mahomes still played a pretty damn good game. It's like every NHL game, it's like every professional sports, yeah, match game. Well, Shocking. I'd say, yeah, I'd say there's a lot more refing questions in the NHL than a lot of other sports during the regular season, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Probably that it's something to well we can expand on a future for sure. Uh, did That's anyone bye fi- week discussion? Yeah. Did anyone find what the Oilers did on Saturday to Chicago disrespectful when they put in the e bug after they were up five six seven to two? No. Unbelievably disrespectful to the goddamn game. <laughs> I've How heard dare fans. You? I've heard fans upset. I've yet to hear anyone in the Chicago organization upset. Like I don't think any of them care. Why the fuck would the fans be upset? Good God. The uh, <laughs> like how how about you fuck off? Honest to God, fuck off and understand the, the relevance of it all. It's Seriously. a good story. Yeah. You know, we all love I mean, look at the most, you know, the, the best NHL stories over the past five years have been the emergency goalie stories. Right, Jeff? Yeah. Oh yeah, Zamboni <laughs> driver employed by the Toronto organization beat. Toronto Maple Leafs, it's great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 but like honestly, that that goes to show the the relevance of it all. Who fucking cares? It's it's about like realistically, why why are we loving this sport so much? It's about the individual yeah. accomplishments of it all. Ovechkin potentially beating Wayne Gretzky in in the goal scoring. Um, y- y- you have. I mean, I, I I wanted to go on a list, but I can't really think of anything else right now. But well, you, 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 like you, you, you cheer for Mark the, the Mark Giordano's of uh, you cheer for uh, the people exactly. Yeah. You cheer for the people. The stories are huge. Stuff. Yeah, like in in the grand scheme of things, this will just get be another little anecdote in in the and footnote in, in 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 NHL hockey history. But for that for that guy, that's a that that's is. Great. 
that's yeah. a, a lifetime true. memory. Yeah. Like that's and the NHL's full of these silly stories, all the way from the Taro Tujimoto story in Buffalo through, yeah, this guy. Like, you know, the NHL's just full of these quirky little stories of, you know, pay players that existed or didn't exist or whatever. Yeah. Oh, Taro Tujimoto. That's such a great story. That's who the Flames need to to solve their season woes. <laughs> Not Yarmy Yager. Well, they can fire Daryl and hire Tujimoto behind the bench. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I don't see the big deal. I mean, people say it was disrespectful. The Oilers were already up and you know what, if, if this, you know, if anything, you're saying Chicago should be able to get back in it then. I mean, you know, they gave the kid a chance and, and why not? He came out of his, he went out of his way to become your, your goalie for the night. Why not give him a chance? Why not give him that shot? And you know yeah. it wasn't even the fucking coach's decision. It no. was Connor McDavid asking the coach, uh, uh, Jay R- uh, Woodcroft, to to put him in. That's yeah. a good idea. Absolutely, it is. And it sounds like Campbell good on Connor for doing that. Yeah, hey, I everyone. think it would have been different if you put this kid in, you know, the line of fire all night or something. But when you've got the game sewn up, why not? Yeah, I, I've asked: Is it any less respectful than pulling your goaltender? Like. With three minutes to go. Yeah. And what, like a four-goal lead? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a great story. That's, um, is there anything else we need to talk about before I say the one last thing? Nope. Can we go down Arizona and the depth that they have in that organization? <laughs> we'll get That'd Mike Gould on. Yeah, we'll good. get my good. Yeah. Um, How good are those jerseys? <laughs> they actually they're they have some damn good jerseys. Even their AHL jerseys I like too. Um anyway. Uh all I will say about Bobby Hall, um, great hockey player, shitty human being. That's I think all of that, you know, he passed away today. Um, great hockey player, shitty human being, and I understand that people are angry and your feelings on Bobby Hall are valid, and that's where I will leave it. I think at some point, and I've said this about Theo Fleury too, I think at some point we have to look at what they did as a professional on the ice. They, they, they definitely have something towards that. We, we don't we don't talk about the uh, the good the good people Hall of Fame because then Curtis Lazar would be a part of that. Um, you you got to look at uh, what, what each individual player yeah, has done Michael on the Stone ice. Stone will be part of that. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's not the, what is it? The Canadian Tire Good Deeds Cup we're going for here. It's, it's the hockey. Yeah, it's, yeah, I know. But at the same time, what Bobby Hall has been reported. I think it, it's, 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 it's not necessarily that though. It's the legacy at this point. We're more, it's more about the legacy, which is why I think it's, it's great. It, it, I think what, what Kevin said is actually exactly what I, I've been saying on the yeah. ice. Mm-hmm. Great legacy off the ice. I look at the Hollywood there. Walk of Fame. There's a bunch of people there that are terrible human beings, good actors. Yep. yep. That's- and I think it, that for me, I think you need to be able to have that talk about both. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you need to realize when they're not a good person, but I don't think you should maybe not celebrate their professional accomplishments because of it. Yeah. I, that's, I, yeah, I, I get where you're at. Yeah. Okay. What? What? No. Go ahead, Sean. Were you going to say something? No. No. I'm just. I'm just. Just like. All right. Awkward silence. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Well, let's leave it here. So, Dan, what do you? What do you got? Okay. So you're going to put this podcast on your feed. So this is going on your feed. And That's then right. You're Fireside having... Chat dropped tonight. Our new episode. Um, so if you want to listen to that, you can go to firesidechat.ca. You can find us anywhere that fine podcasts are found. Uh, find us on. Apple, Spotify, everywhere. Um, our social media is up there as well. And then next week, one week from today, so that would be the uh, the 5th of uh, February, this will go into the Fireside Chat feed as well as a bit of a bonus episode. So we'll call it a crossover. Is that because I came on? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. And then Devin came on. I'm like, well, now it's got to be a bonus episode. <laughs> little little tongue-in-cheek there for people who are not looking at my face right now. <laughs> Devin, it was yeah. going to go on the OnlyFans page, but when you came on, it was now it's going to be free to the world. I said, "Hey, listen, if it's OnlyFans, this this tarp needs to come off." 
<laughs> I thought about creating an OnlyFans page for people to pay me not to post my feet. <laughs> yeah. I will leave my clothes on if you pay me. Yeah. No. Uh, anyway. Whoa, that went way over somewhere else. <laughs> So how do we follow you, Dan? Uh, you can find us uh, firesidechat.ca. You can find us oops, on Twitter. Uh, we are facebook.com slash firesidechat at firesidepodcast on Twitter. Um, firesidechat underscore podcast on Instagram or find us anywhere that fine podcasts are found. Okay, and Sean, how do we follow you? I am BeardedConnect03 on Twitter. You can follow Gavin? me on t- Twitter at uh, gordhow 9 and yeah, and you can follow Tyler T N O B L E, Chris is Schneids, S C H N E I D Z. I am K E V O L E, Shifts and Pucks, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, subscribe wherever you get your audio, Area 51 Sports Network. We will figure out our schedule again. I mean, well, just uh probably this weekend we will dig into uh, more Canucks news, or we'll get in, dig into some other stuff. I mean, we'll get uh, Tyler and Chris's perspective on what happened with the Bo Horvat tra- trade, and maybe something else happens. Who knows? There's an all-star Just... game. That's going to happen. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, but no, in terms of other things that could happen, in terms of maybe another trade happens, who knows? But uh, we thank all of you for watching, listening. We thank you for all the comments. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, but thanks for everyone. Share, like, subscribe, tell your friends about us, and we will talk to you very soon. Bye for now. Oilers suck. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.